Well, this morning I'd like to uh, bring you up to date on some legislation that I focused on recently. A uh, number of uh, things I have in the works at various stages of development that does impact the 99th district. Uh, first of all, I've been working diligently with Representative La Tourette in uh, Geauga County to bring forward a school resource officer bill. Uh, we know that school security is an important issue for all of us, and uh, the Ohio Revised Code is silent on what a re school resource officer is, what it does, uh, what the training might be, and so what we're trying to do is to grandfather in those schools who already have such a resource officer and lay forward a pathway that includes two primary elements. One, a description of the responsibilities, and secondly, a, an overview of the training that would be required for a position such as this. And the idea is ultimately to bring about some standardization throughout the state of Ohio because it is a hybrid. It's not really law enforcement as we know it because they have so much more dealings with children inside a school where there are uh, school rules interfaced with, with the normal uh, criminal code in the state of Ohio. Uh, but there's, there's some interpersonal counseling that takes place. It's a whole different, it's a whole different animal. And yet, it's still law enforcement, peace officers. So the idea is to uh, massage the needs of what school districts should require for such a position, along with the role, overarching role, of a police officer. Uh, we've gone through five iterations of this bill now with interested parties from the Fraternal Order of Police to uh, there's an organization on the Case Western Reserve that deals with student rights. Uh, School Resource Officer Association, uh, State of Ohio, the National School Resource Officer Association, uh, the uh, Ohio Federation of Teachers, the Ohio Education Association, the Buckeye, uh, Buckeye Association of School Administrators, uh, all those interested parties we've brought together to craft a bill that I think will put us on the right path towards determining what this school resource officer ought to be doing and the training that goes with that. Ultimately, it would be my preference that we, once we've identified this, can begin to, to uh, fund it at the state level because we do know it's such an important, uh, an important position to fill in our schools, should they want to, should they want to, uh, going forward. So that's, that's one piece of legislation I'm working on. The second bill, which uh, should be introduced in the next uh, few days is a repairing buffer strip bill designed specifically for the West Lake Erie Basin. We know that we've dodged a bullet this summer with respect to algal blooms on, the, on Lake Erie. Uh, the weather cooperated early. We had spring rains, but thankfully the summer was not as hot as it could have been that uh, worked in our benefit to keep those algal blooms at a minimum. However, in September, uh, there, was some very, there were some very warm temperatures which triggered a bloom. In fact, uh, Toledo was supposed to have a regatta on the Maumee River, which was canceled because there was this pea soup covering on the river and it, it just was no time or uh, place to hold such a regatta. So, this bill, what it does, it carves out the Western Lake Erie Basin, first of all, for the zone of consideration. And what it would do would be to incentivize farmers and those engaged in agriculture to install a buffer strip, should they want to, a buffer strip of permanent vegetation, or it could be um, uh, seedlings of uh, various shrubs or trees that are, that are approved, that are non-invasive, uh, 35 feet to 100 feet along the banks of permanent waterways. It could be ponds, it could be streams, Rivers. But the idea is to create this strip so that water can be filtered first, water containing that phosphorus before it enters into the, the waterway. And here's how this would work. Uh, we would offer under this bill zero property tax for land taken out of farm production for this particular program. The local government and the local school district, because they would be losing potentially that tax money, would be held harmless. The funds would come out of the general revenue fund, 
from the state reimbursed locally because after all, water is a public good, it's a public benefit. And we cannot, I don't want to mandate, I will not mandate, uh, uh, agriculture being forced into a situation like this. I think incentivizations work better. And as a result, uh, this program would allow us to move forward with water purity, the same water purification that we see, but also uh, allow for flexibility on the part of the agricultural person who might wish to pursue this sort of thing. Should that person decide to take land out of uh, the riparian buffer strip program, no penalty, just need to inform uh, the local taxing district that the, uh, the land is going to be put back into use. Uh, so there is the possibility of moving in and moving out. But the idea is to uh, allow such strips to do their magic naturally and, and to help water purification. Another bill, and I've discussed this before, is stem debt relief that uh, it is waiting for its first hearing. I have a joint sponsor on the other side of the aisle. And the notion here is to incentivize uh, young people to stay and work in the state of Ohio if they have a STEM degree program. Now, I was reading, in fact, just last night uh, in one of my reports, uh, the concern for automation in the workforce. Ohio makes things. That's what we do. That's what, why we've been successful, so successful so many decades. The problem was with automation coming to the assembly line, uh, workers are being displaced. And uh, this conversation came up just last week in Columbus with the automated uh, uh, buses. Columbus has been uh, chosen as a smart city, and they're currently working on a transportation plan in fact, there is a prototype of this already in place out of Las Vegas, where buses would run from one end to the other uh, without a driver, uh, using uh, the latest technology. That's fine, that's good, but we also then have an unemployment problem, potentially with those drivers who are now out of a job. Point is, that's just one example of how automation in the workforce displaces the workers that have come to rely on those jobs. The study that I was reading last night points to the number of jobs that could be, in the next few years, displaced by automation. The number one position that will not be displaced through automation are those jobs in the field of STEM, because the STEM field produces the individuals who actually create the robotics that do the eventual assemblage. So if we can think about this, if we can manufacture the manufacturing process that will then turn out a finished material, that's what I'm after. And that's why these STEM degree uh, graduates are so important. It's the engineering, it's the math, it's the science combined together, and the technology combined together that will be the, the cornerstone of the new workforce. And I want to give you an example. Recently, Ford Motor Company, February of this year, announced a billion dollars being invested in the autonomous vehicle. And we might think that Ford would be looking at Detroit, Michigan, or maybe Boston, or perhaps uh, somewhere in California to institute this plan. They actually chose Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And the reason they chose Pittsburgh was the fact that Carnegie Mellon is number one in the world for robotics. So it only makes sense to move your operation where the action is taking place in that, that current hot field. So how does this relate to Ohio? I would suggest to you that Ohio has several indigenous uh, components of manufacturing and industrialization that cannot be out, outsourced. So let me give you some examples. Northeast Ohio, for example, we are the healthcare corridor hotspot for the entire world. And the research that's done in the Cleveland Clinic, University Hospital Systems, sweeping down through our state with the other anchor, 
being UPMC of Pittsburgh. There is no other fertile crescent like this in the entire world for healthcare. And so, those STEM-related jobs in the healthcare industry would naturally gravitate here if we indeed had the workforce, because we already have the anchor institutions. Likewise, in Southwest Ohio, aviation, aeronautics, with Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, our largest employer in the state, we are well situated, and there's research going down, down there now that is classified. Uh, Air Force is, is uh, drone research in, in, in particular. But the point of the matter is, that bed of research and innovation is not going to leave Ohio, cannot be outsourced. STEM degree persons would be well situated there. In Northwest Ohio, Agritech, with the Center for Innovation for Food Technology, CIFT, C-I-F-T, already located in Toledo with a world population that's growing, that by 2050 is going to reach 9 billion people. There are all kinds of needs in terms of uh, packaging, processing, logistics that could be uh, augmented by the STEM, uh, STEM field and, and those persons familiar with it. Southeast Ohio, think about energy-related endeavors. Uh, long history with oil and gas, and certainly we can see that as a bridge industry, but think of solar, think of wind, think of renewables, and think of the research that could be done and the products that could be made on those cutting-edge fields right here in the state of Ohio. My point is, this bill will pay off to a certain extent, and I'll give you an example, uh, for a five-year period, uh, 4000 a year, so 20000 totals, if you earned a bachelor's degree in the state of Ohio, and if that particular person works in the state of Ohio. Now, if you move, program's off. But by incentivizing young people to stay here, we can help jumpstart some of the fields necessary uh, that require STEM degree uh, graduates, at the same time, keeping our people here helps to rebuild our communities from the inside out. And who among us wouldn't want to have their children stay in Ohio with a well-paying job in the future and with the ability for parents and grandparents to, to be present uh, while, while uh, those families are being raised? Uh, we'll see where this goes. It, it's still waiting its first hearing, but the idea is to think of the future today so that we'll be prepared for it when it comes tomorrow. Do you have any idea when this hearing might be held? Will it be before the first year? Or It'll be probably be after the first year. I mean, it's uh, in the queue right now. Um, and it will be heard probably in the Finance Committee, but uh, there's been no indication that, it, that it's coming up. And I came across this article uh, recently, and I did a deep dive uh, last night into a lot of reading that I love to do, but sometimes don't have the time for. Uh, this comes from, uh, uh, this was as a result of the Farm Science Review in, in uh, Columbus back in uh, September. And the title is, Jobs Pay at the Root of Rural Ohio's Opioid Crisis. And I've been suspecting this for a long time. Uh, there are two researchers here from Ohio State University. And uh, one of them is uh, Dr. Betts from the... Um, uh, he's with the human, uh, human Sciences at Ohio State. It says, and I'm just going to read some of the highlights and comment on it. Despair caused by a lack of jobs and hope is the greatest single factor in the growing opioid addiction crisis in rural Ohio. And that is us. Uh, low wages and a failure to obtain the American dream ultimately leads to opium addiction. And what they've done is to look at some of the numbers uh, and the research on it. And I, and I quote Dr. Betts here, there's been some good research on this recently that shows how uh, the opioid overdeaths, uh, death rates interact in, in, in the rural counties. Research have found that looking at unemployment rates in counties, and here it is, for a 1% increase in the unemployment rate, the overdose death rate increases 3.6%. So when you think about a county with a five-year jobless rate change of 3%, which during the Great Recession isn't out of the realm of possibilities, he continued, that increase, that would increase the overdose death rate by 10%. And 
And uh, the connection is there's more and more evidence that employment is an important factor in the overdose problem. And then it's not just employment, but the lack of living wages. He goes on to say, uh, what kind of jobs are we talking about here? Good manufacturing jobs that were making $25 an hour a few years ago. Maybe we're talking about retail jobs now that make $12, even $15 an hour. And here's what he says. Preliminary work that he has done and a couple of co-authors looked at how wages affect this. And they found that for a 1% decrease in wages, you see a 3.5% increase in the overdose death rates. So if you take the lack of jobs coupled with jobs that aren't paying uh, what they ought to be, you can see we have a real potent force here with respect to helping this crisis get legs, which we certainly don't want. Goes on to say this number is even higher for rural whites. It is about 4.5%. So for rural whites, if there is a 3% decline in wages in the county, these could be almost a 15% increase in drug overdoses. So, uh, one other thing I'd like to read here. Since 1980 in Appalachian, Ohio, and that's us, there has been literally zero job growth, while in metropolitan areas such as Columbus, there's been 75% job growth. And that further exacerbates this problem because where do our, our, our young people go to get real jobs? They go to the city. And what's left? A limited pool of jobs that aren't paying a living wage. Which takes me then back to the bill that I talked about recently, this STEM debt bill. We need good paying jobs and there are pockets out there that can be incentivized for all corners of Ohio. And those are the jobs in, in STEM degree that start between sixty-five, seventy thousand dollars a year and in, they easily uh, can, can push the six-figure mark depending upon the industry. My point is those are the jobs that create the other well-paid jobs that lift the tide for everybody in the community. We cannot continue to think that coal is going to come back, that manufacturing is going to be the way it was twenty years ago. The reality is that we have to accept conditions as they are. Uh, and that doesn't mean we like them. That doesn't mean we can't work on them. But the point of the matter is, the reality is that we have to change the way we look at rural employment. What can we do to create those good jobs and how do we keep those young people here to reinvest their lives and their fortunes in Ohio? What kind of timetable are we looking at for this kind of program? Well, the problem is we didn't get in this position overnight. We're not going to get out overnight. And um, this is a long-term approach that I'm looking for. I want to get at the root of the opioid problem. And I agree, uh, being a former teacher and, and, and knowing the hope that a, a lot of my students had that the world was going to be their oyster, that they were going to have a good paying job, that they'd have a family, and yet the reality says that many of them have lost their lives to the opioid crisis. Uh, I believe that it does come down to hope. If we have a reason to get up in the morning to go to work and to do work that's productive, that's meaningful to us, that gives back to society, that's one tool in our toolbox that works against the, this, this addiction that we have. And it's also the, the, the feeling of despair that, that this is a tidal wave that, that, that is going to overwhelm us. And we have to address that head on too. We have natural resources. We have human resources. We have many wonderful uh, elements in the 99th district that can't be replicated anywhere else. We have, for example, the largest inland lake in Ohio, we, public lake, and that's private too. We have the largest private lake, and that's Roaming Shores. We have the Great Lake, which is Erie. We have uh, two deep water ports in Geneva, or excuse me, Geneva as a marina, Ashabilla and Conneaut. Northwest, east, north-south, east-west railroad, uh, class one railroad system. We have an airport that's just been renovated. We have a, a nice blend between rural and, and um, suburban living, if you will. Uh, all of this going for us, that, that can't be outsourced, that can't be taken away, we have to see that the glass is half full. And knowing that, 
and working together to see what sort of options we can incentivize businesses and, and, and opportunities, jobs. My goodness gracious, there are jobs being created right now that weren't even thought of five years ago. But we have to have a workforce that's nimble, that's able to change, to, uh, to meet the needs of industry and, and labor, and, in, and understand that, that we are competing in a global economy. Uh, and I think working together with an eye on reality, but with a, our, our, our future focus in, in, in our hearts, that we can do just that. So what I'm talking about is, uh, is the, the, the foundation of a comprehensive, cohesive policy to move us out of this challenge that we have uh, with respect to, to opioid abuse. In the short term, in the short term, we have taken some steps, and, the, and they're small. For example, just this fall, we opened up a, a new facility at Glen Bay for treatment. We can't build enough facilities quickly enough, nor can we afford to, to run them. The problem is, is, is that pervasive. But that's reality. It's, we're doing the best we can. On the law enforcement end, there is a movement in the legislature to uh, reclassify some of these drugs so that uh, the, uh, the dealers could be taken off the street and, and be put away. The problem is that now we would have to, uh, and here's the challenge, we only have so much prison space. Ohio's prisons were designed for 30-some thousand inmates, I think it's like 32,000, currently hold over 50,000. There are people who say, well, we should, we should lock them up. Okay, we can do that, but it comes at a price. And if we're willing to pay that price, at the expense of other things in the budget, we can do that, but we have to have that, that conversation. And it, involve, it would involve tax dollars. I mean, right here in Asheville County, our commissioners have felt and, and that we should do not only uh, more for, for care and, and recovery, but also uh, that they're looking at a new jail. Well, that's gonna come at a cost. So all of those options are out there, but we've got to decide as a population where our priorities are, where we want to spend our money, and, and how we're going to achieve that, that particular goal. I have another bill. Uh, it's an incentivization bill, I, I believe strongly in incentives, to repurpose some of our classrooms, or maybe even add on, if during the building phase, and I'm thinking of some of the new uh, schools that were constructed here recently, uh, if they were constructed without a, uh, a, 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 an ag uh, laboratory uh, for vocational agriculture or consumer science. Uh, this bill would allow uh, school districts in, compar in, in, uh, in uh, partnership with the state to do a 50-50 uh, cost benefit that would reconfigure some of these classrooms. Now, why is that important? Uh, I know in, in our situation in Jefferson, when we moved from the old building and it was torn down to the new building, there was no, no uh, area left for vocational agriculture. And yet our farm population, which is one of the major businesses here in the 99th district, aging population, and we need a feeder system for uh, filling those particular um, positions. And as such, if we retrofit some of these schools with local money and with state money, it would encourage that sort of uh, repurposing. And the other thing, too, that ties in with this, consumer science, those things that, uh, that are important to us, cooking in the home and balancing a checkbook, those life skills that have kind of been swept aside for the increased demand on testing, uh, we want to make sure that, that those opportunities are available as well. So the way this bill works, that if a district is so inclined, uh, and the window is up 2021, that we're not going to open this, this isn't going to be an ongoing thing. But if schools are so motivated, and I'm thinking especially in the rural areas, that they might, in, in partnership with the state, decide to undertake a very small, there's a million dollar cap on this uh, per project, that uh, they might undertake such a building uh, program 
to meet the needs of students and society uh, in that particular community. And finally, as we close 2017 and begin to uh, look forward to 2018, I want to thank you for uh, all your continued support and for your reaching out to me and, and making me aware of issues that, that spring up uh, from time to time. Uh, many people have asked me on, on occasions how in, in the midst of such overwhelming circumstances I can put on my happy face and, and, and get down to Columbus and, and carry on the, the fight for Northeast Ohio. And it's precisely because of you. Every one of our constituents is important. And I work for all 115,000. And as such, I'm very grateful. I'm humbled for that. And I will continue to work to the best of my ability uh, to work for all of our people as we seek together a better future for our district. And I want to thank you for that and uh, wish you all the most wonderful holiday seasons and a very prosperous 2018.